Great. So welcome to this remote interview. My name is Lisette, and I'm interviewing people and companies doing great things remotely. And today on the line, all the way from the Boston, Massachusetts area in the United States, I have Dr. Heidi Gardner. Dr. Gardner, you are a distinguished fellow at Harvard Business School. You are the co-founder of Gardner & Co., and you are the author of a book that's coming out very soon on the 1st of November called Smarter Collaboration, a new approach to breaking down barriers and transforming work. Congratulations. By the way, I know how hard it is to write a book. And I want to start with our opening question, which is what does your virtual office look like and what do you need to get your work done? Thanks, Lizette. Thanks so much for having me and uh, really delighted to be with you to discuss these. Just a small point, I'm actually a distinguished fellow at Harvard Law School. I was a professor at the business school. Uh, no, it's totally confusing because I was a professor at the business school for six years. And then, as we say here in Boston, moved across the river. Uh, and I'm now at the at the law school. So uh, just, uh, you know, I'm not a lawyer. And so that makes it doubly confusing why it is that I'm uh, uh, teaching and uh, researching at the law school. But um, to dive Dive into answering your question. My home office is really not a home office. It's home offices. I uh, I have the privilege of working in a space where I get to match my surroundings and where I'm working at any given hour to what it is that I need to get done. And so I chose to work in one of those places for the conversation with you. This is my living room which I've co-opted as um, one of my working spaces. And when I'm having any sort of relationship-driven work, this is where I like to be. It is warm. It is uh, inviting. It puts me in a really generative frame of mind. Um, I'm looking here at my couch where I actually sat to write most of my last book because it's a book on collaboration and I needed to be in that generative mindset, really coming up with new ideas and being able to work through them in ways that were both um, creative and practical. And that's what this space does for me. I have a, a formal office and it's got a wall of diplomas behind me. And so I use that when I am in a more formal presentation setting where I know that the audience really needs to know that they're hearing from somebody who's credentialed. And that, you know, when I'm looking at my screen and I'm seeing multiple diplomas from around the world behind me, it reminds me that that's the frame of mind I need to be in. I'm an authority and that that's what the people I'm speaking to expect to hear. And so those are, you know, two different spaces. My third favorite space to work here in the house is actually on my treadmill. And uh, I tend to do a lot of my meetings um, when I'm having conversations with people, doing internal meetings, even when I'm having client conversations, I find I work best when I'm walking. I'm really not good at sitting still or even standing still. I like to have my brain waves um, match to the rhythm of my steps. And there's a lot of research on this, by the way. I'm not completely crazy. It's backed up by science that, um, that for certain kinds of thinking, motion really works well. And so I'm fortunate that I've got a treadmill that I could rig up as a walking desk. And that's the third place in my home that I tend to do a lot of work. I love that. A colleague of mine, Eves Sanul, if you're listening, shout out to Eves. He also has a treadmill walking desk and has had it for years and loves it. He walks like 20,000 steps a day or, you know, something like ridiculous. So yeah, it's, uh, you have to get used to it a little bit. And then you're right. It does have a different frame of mind. I know my husband and I, when we have difficult conversations, we go on a walk. We don't like sit down and stare at each other. And that has really helped, you know, the conversation because oh, there's something that comes up and you have air and nice things to look at. I really love your three different spaces. One more relationship driven and warm, the other one more credentialed. Um, and then the other one sort of then in moving, putting you in a different frame of mind. I think people forget how important space is to our frame of mind. So I love that you have all these examples. I want to dive into now your uh, upcoming book, Smarter Collaboration. And to start us on this topic, I want to start by asking you, what is smart collaboration or what is good collaboration even? Let's start with what does that mean? Because I think we conflate it a lot with communication. 
Oh, it's conflated with all sorts of things. Uh, sometimes people talk about collegiality or they talk about, you know, all these factors that get bundled under quote unquote soft topics or soft skills. And when we're talking about smart collaboration, we're actually talking about a very deliberate, hyper intentional way of thinking about the outcome and reverse engineering who needs to be involved, who's going to truly add value to that outcome. So our problems today are so complex and multifaceted that if we sit in a dark room by, our, by ourselves and try to imagine what that solution is or crunch through it through analytics on our own, we're going to miss some very crucial aspects of these more complex problems. For example, take ESG. It's a term, you know, environmental social governance that gets thrown around a lot, or even just sustainability. What does that mean? If you say sustainability and you only bring in somebody who's, you know, a climate scientist or a climate expert or, you know, that's one angle of it. But sustainability has all sorts of other pieces wrapped up with it. And if we miss the human factor in the historical context and the cultural elements and you know, political dynam dynamics, you can bring in a host of other kinds of dimensions that for any particular sustainability problem you're trying to solve may or may not be crucial. And so we need to start with the end in mind. What are we trying to do by teaming up and then dissecting the problem? What kinds of perspectives or life experiences or knowledge bases would be really valuable? And then again, being deliberate about when do you need those perspectives? At what point in the problem solving process? Because I think, you know, one of the big problems that comes out of a move towards more collaboration is the pendulum swinging too far and people over collaborating. And so we need to get people very thoughtful, very purposeful about who's involved and who isn't. That's what we mean by smart collaboration. So really thinking about first the outcome, what is it that we're trying to do here? And then working backwards from that, which sort of leads me into my next question with, which is, and it, and it ties hand in hand and it may be the answer, which is what's wrong with how we're collaborating now? There is a lot wrong with how we're collaborating now. Um, part of it is that people don't take time to understand what it is that they're trying to achieve. And they either use collaboration as a cover their backside approach, as in, let's just pull everyone together and try to reach some kind of consensus. And if somebody doesn't show up to the meeting, well, they had their chance. So, you know, don't don't come to me afterward and tell me that you disagree. You know, so there's those kinds of problems where you get too many people involved for the sake of consensus building or some other political outcome, which is not necessary for a great solution. Another problem with how we collaborate today is simply throwing a team at everything. Again, it's, the, you know, it's, it's similar to that lack of intentionality, but the knee-jerk reaction is, hey, let's have a team for this. You know, teams are all the rage. Oh, that's not, not a great idea. I mean, sometimes you just need to crack on and get something done very quickly, or it's a routine problem and somebody knows what that routine is. Hey, just do that again. Um, you know, there are other problems with how people are collaborating, which are covered in one of the chapters of our book. We talk about uh, the veneer of inclusivity, um, the illusion of inclusion is what we say. And simply having different kinds of people on a team does not mean that you are engaging in smart collaboration. The first step might be getting different kinds of people on the team. And by different kinds, that could be people who are coming from different functions, right? You need sales and marketing and engineering and customer service coming together to really figure out how to delight the customer. Or it could be people from different generations. We are considering a new marketing campaign. You know, for example, in, in my business outside of Harvard, Gardner & Co., we were just working with a huge global drinks and snack manufacturer. And they were talking about one of their complex problems, which is the confluence of strong inflation and hard to predict consumer demand, you know, fast changing consumer demands. And one of the ahas coming out of that is the different sorts of experts you need, marrying people who have strong 
expertise and experience in the economic side with people who have no clue necessarily about the economics, but they are very in touch through all of their different activities with a new generation of consumers. And so they're better able to help make predictions about where the market is going. You marry that with the economists and the people with the financial expertise thinking about what are the implications in an inflationary environment on how that's going to affect our business, and you get a much more holistic solution to a complex problem. All right, so uh, if you didn't, if you had all of those right people on the team, but but some of the people with fresh perspectives were junior, and therefore you didn't actually listen to their contributions, that would not be smart collaboration. That would be the illusion of inclusion. It looks as if you've got the right kind of team there, but you're not operating in a way that really harnesses their full potential. I love it. So some of the problems is we've got too many cooks in the kitchen, right? Too many people collaborating on one thing and we're trying to include and come to a consensus. I live in the Netherlands. It's very much a consensus-based culture where everybody has to have a say, pros and cons to that system, I will say. And then of course you have the second problem, which is we're throwing a team on it. But now you start to get into diversity and inclusion, and this is actually becoming a topic uh, that's more important because of the hybrid workforce. And what we're seeing is that the people that loved the flexible option were the people were women and minorities and disabled and people like military spouses, people who are moving around a lot. And I guess the fear is that we're going, you know, with the hybrid work model, the uh, if we're not careful, we lose a lot of the diversity in our workforce because we're staying home and the and it might become, I think the fear is a white male dominated workforce if we're not really careful in this hybrid world. What does smart collaboration tell us about diversity and inclusion in that way in terms of the hybrid workforce or what have you been seeing? I do think that there is a risk that the people who actively choose not to work from the classical office space will be certain kinds of people. And that may or may not be a problem as long as hybrid working is working well, such that the people wherever they are, are deeply included and have equal kinds of opportunities. That's very hard to engineer. And so I do think that there is a risk that it creates the the haves and the have nots or you know different classes, if you will, of people who have access to different kinds of relationships or mentoring or resources or opportunities or knowledge. So I, I think that that's a risk. I think there's also uh, a chance that done right, the opportunity for hybrid working means that organizations can be far more inclusive. So I'm thinking about um, an organization that uh, I'm familiar with. They're based in one of the Western US states. It is a pretty homogenous community. And um, it, this uh, it's a FinTech company. It was founded in a place that was not particularly diverse on any dimension, you know, um, ethnically, uh, even, you know, religiously, uh, you know, it was a very homogenous community. And now over the last, you know, three plus years, they've had the opportunity to bring in people from all over and, and, and not only include them as, you know, important employees, but on this very senior leadership team. It's given them, this company, the opportunity to incredibly um, uh, broaden the base that they're recruiting from because they no longer believe that somebody has to live in this small town out in the, you know, in, in, in the, you know, the, the mountain regions in the U.S. And when organizations open their minds about what it means to be part of our company or part of our organization, it gives them the opportunity to access very different kinds of people. But of course, Lizette, what that means is that the, the work environment has to be one where people do have equitable opportunities and a strong voice, however it is they're participating in any given meeting. 
I love it. And it's also a good reminder for me, especially that diversity comes from all kinds of things. It's not just man versus woman or old versus young. It's like cat people versus dog people and beach people versus mountain people, right? There's sort of a, and we know that diversity is a superpower. So indeed hybrid when done well, uh, opens up a lot of opportunities. How do we do smart collab? How, you know, what, what does smart collaboration in a hybrid environment look like? Again, we need to start with the end in mind, and particularly when people aren't top of mind. We need to be very intentional about not starting any given piece of work until we have taken the time to think through beyond the usual suspects whose perspective is going to be valuable here. Because there is a risk that as potentially more people start coming back to the office, that we, I won't say randomly grab people, but you know, have a, a recency bias in our mind. Whom have we seen yesterday or whom have we seen recently? Ah, that's the person whose expertise we need. And that may well be true, but they may not be best placed to engage because everyone else has just seen them in the office and they've just gotten pulled on to three other things. And so we need to make sure that organizations operating in a hybrid way have uh, easy access to jogging people's memory about who else is a possibility. Um, and, you know, I'm not advocating an old fashioned knowledge management database. I mean, those things get outdated really, really quickly, but there are technology enabled solutions that allow us to quickly understand who's not only got expertise or experience in an area, but also potentially who's got availability. And it is uh, it allows people to sort of raise their hand and say, I'm open to a new kind of opportunity. Here's what it is that I'm seeking. Here's what my strengths are. And here's what my development goals are. I might not be the expert in understanding inflation, but I'd like to get on that project we just talked about um, to round out some of my knowledge about operating in an inflationary environment that's new to me but I'd like to give it a try. I love it. So as you talk about availability, immediately the topic of collaboration overload springs to mind. And I think everybody can relate to collaboration overload, especially in the last few years, right? We took all of the processes that we had in person and everybody went online and we had to learn to work in a whole new way and it did result in collaboration overload. So that's what I'm thinking. And of, of course, you know, I'm not understanding how much availability people has. We start to put more and more tasks onto people and then we don't know how much everybody has. I mean, that's sort of my, my, uh, very basic definition of collaboration overload. But when I, but when we talk about collaboration overload, what, what do you mean by that? Because you write about it in your book. Well, let me start by calling attention to some research done by Professor Rob Cross of Babson College, uh, which is also here in the Boston area. And Rob Cross's research has identified that about three to 5% of employees in a typical organization bear a massive collaboration burden. And so in essence, it's the, it's the old adage, if you want something done, ask a busy person. You know, the idea that um, somebody who's already deeply engaged across the organization, has lots of different kinds of experiences, has their own big network, ah, that's the best person for us to pull into this project because of the assets that they bring. But the asset that they're missing is mindshare. And when you get the same people involved repeatedly in any given initiative, Rob and I wrote an HBR article, a Harvard Business Review article, um, where we touch on this piece when it comes to agile working and agile initiatives. Um, when you have the, the same people who are drafted repeatedly for different kinds of initiatives or projects or responsibilities, they're going to get overloaded. And all of the reasons that collaboration is beneficial start to fade away. So for example, 
if there's an individual who gets tapped, you know, spread too thinly across multiple projects, they're not going to be able to bring their deep expertise to bear in a joined up way with colleagues who have different points of view. It takes time for other people to understand these different perspectives and different knowledge bases, et cetera. And if somebody is so stretched that they can't spend the time conversing with people, explaining the rationale behind their recommendations, et cetera, smart collaboration is not actually going to happen. You might have a piecemeal solution that looks more like a tossed salad with a bunch of different pieces in there just happen to be mixed together as opposed to the stew where everything is melded together and the flavors are merged and it becomes more powerful because of each ingredient. And I think um, we need to make sure that we don't overburden certain individuals. There's another related piece that I'd like to, to draw together to the theme we're talking about, which is diversity and inclusion and overcommitment. Because what we see in a number of organizations is that good intentions around both diversity and collaboration have backfired. And here's what I mean. Take a professional services firm. They might have 30% of their partners are women. They have clients who, again, very well-intentioned are saying, our society is roughly 50-50, men and women. We want every project team to be 50-50, even at the partner level. Well, the, the provider, the firm, has to take their 30% women partners and spread them across all of these client projects where there's a, essentially a quota imposed. And those women then end up spending less time per project, which means they tend to get pigeonholed. Oh, you know, Heidi's the one who does this piece of work. It's easy to make her plug and play. Let's just drop her in. She does that bit of work and she comes out again. If that's happening to me, my ability to stretch and grow is really limited. My ability, if I'm holding these, you know, across many projects at once, my ability to get FaceTime with the client or even with more senior colleagues is also limited. And my ability to therefore get sponsors inside or and outside the organization or to get coaching and mentoring is limited. And so the intention for getting more women on the team is to enhance both the experience of those women the, the learning and development and, and professional experiences of those women. It's to get a better solution on the project and it's to enhance the pipeline of women coming through the organization. All of those objectives get undermined when people are stretched too thinly, when they're overcommitted. And we have the data to back this up. This isn't just my observation. You know, everything I'm talking about here is that we have collected millions of data records from companies around the planet, sometimes 10 years worth of data that we can analyze what happened in year three based on decisions that were taken in year one. And we build econometric models and, and statistical models. So what I'm talking about here, you know, without getting into the boring details, you know, what some people consider boring, I love crunching the numbers. I was going to say, I can't imagine. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, without getting into the details here, what I'll tell you is, you know, we are backing up this quote unquote soft topic with data and analytics and science and math. And we can show that some of these outcomes, like I'm just talking about, undermining the diversity and inclusion intentions, it happens based on the idea that collaboration is going to solve these problems. And it won't unless we are very thoughtful and making sometimes tough choices about which objectives we're trying to satisfy at any given moment. Man, I love this. Uh, I love this. And one, be, being officially like overcommitted myself or having a being a chronic overcommitter, it's taken me years to really get to the place where I can understand uh, how much I can take on in a schedule um, and still do good work. And it makes me also think about like highways and interstates. They're usually built to be at 70% capacity or a certain percentage capacity because that's where they flow and the traffic flows best. And when you get over like 70%, you start to get the traffic jams. And it's reminding me that I think collaboration seems to work 
in a similar way. Like when we overcommit ourselves, it kind of jams up, it jams up the work somehow. It sounds like you have the the data to show that as well. Absolutely. You know, when we're talking about genuine, smarter collaboration, it is time consuming. And that's one of the perceived barriers. What our data and many, many, many people's experiences show, however, is that it's an investment, not a cost. And it's an investment in the sense that if you get the right people engaging deeply and for enough time at the right point in any given project, you will have better innovation. Right, which is often wrapped up in the kinds of outcomes people want because they want, you know, competitive advantage, which requires them doing something different than their, you know, than their competitors. Uh, you get better innovation. You avoid rework. Um, and so, what we often find, for example, is that support functions in an organization, whether that's HR or IT or compliance or legal, they aren't brought in early enough in a given project. So. The quote unquote, you know, the business people will get together and make some strategic decisions or operational decisions and go to these support functions afterward and say, we need to hire this many people of this kind, or can you double check that we are not going to be violating any regulations if we do it this way and they pull in compliance. And you have those people in those support functions saying, if you had asked me early on, we could have shaped this outcome in a way that was far more advantageous. And now we have to go back and rewind some of those decisions because you can't do it the way you wanted to. Why didn't you ask me earlier? Right. And it's an example, Lisette, of how um, we get into the mindset of we need to get this done really fast and we can't afford to take the time. We can't afford to be at 70% capacity. We have to be, you know, full on committed to, you know, stretch, stretch, stretch. And it is penny wise and pound foolish in the sense that it feels like you're getting somewhere, but it's really inefficient in the long run or, or suboptimal. Right. Or t- tiring, exhausting, uh, right? As we're all coming out of a pandemic, I think we have to just acknowledge that everybody needs a little time to heal, <laughs> time to sleep, catch up on all of that. So Absolutely. are we the end of our- oh, sorry, Lisa, can I just jump in with, you know, in as much as I keep saying collaboration is not a soft topic, it doesn't mean that there aren't really crucial outcomes that do make people feel good. And I don't think, you know, you were just talking about, you know, post-pandemic and kind of the trauma that people have been facing and how important it is to rejuvenate. And I would like to acknowledge the science underlying the benefits of collaboration on our psychosocial states as well. And so, yes, we can, you know, we can demonstrate empirically that smarter collaboration you know, drives higher revenues and profits. It boosts innovation. It helps to reduce enterprise risk. We can quantify all of those. And, you know, that's chapter one of our new book, but chapter two is the talent case for collaboration. And some of those outcomes are harder to quantify. For example, loneliness, you know, there's a real pandemic of loneliness as well in many societies and getting people together to do meaningful powerful work to you know together is um is an antidote to this kind of of loneliness or or languishing that so many people are feeling so as we're wrapping up i just wanted to make sure that we acknowledge the beneficial aspects of smarter collaboration on our psyche as well as our bottom line I love that because it's not just about rest. You're right. We can have profound satisfaction from working together with people that we enjoy working with or projects that we enjoy working on. Indeed. Absolutely. Indeed. I love that. In fact, I'm intrinsically motivated by relatedness and who I work with. So for me, who I work with is more important than what I'm working on. So indeed, having good collaboration with people that I enjoy would, yeah, kind of makes my day in a, in a sense. A good, a very good reminder. So for our last question, where can people find more? Your book is coming out the 1st of November. It's the year 2022 for those of you listening in the future. Uh, But where can people learn more? Well, so Smarter Collaboration is already available, even uh, if people are listening before November 1st, 2022. It's on uh, all the online retailers in the usual places. And of course, I always, uh, well, maybe not of course, but I do encourage people to to go to their independent retailers as well. And um, our 
research is often um, posted almost immediately on our company website, which is gardnerandco.co. And uh, I welcome people to follow me on LinkedIn as well, because we're putting lots of topical um, ideas and new research out on LinkedIn. Love it. Thank you so much. Dr. Gardner, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. I took copious notes and I think our audience will also enjoy this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. And until next time, everybody, be powerful. <laughs>